I'd like to start by t talking about my own personal experiences in my, the first job I had for the United States government. Uh, I joined the Peace Corps and uh, I'd just gotten out of business school and so the Peace Corps sent me to a training camp in Southern California to learn Spanish for eight weeks and if you speak a second language you know eight weeks is not a lot of time to learn a second language and because I'd come out of business school to learn uh, about credit and ca savings co-ops um, this is incidentally not a very serious part of the speech so if you want to crack a smile you can do that uh, um, and then the Peace Corps sent me to Ecuador to my assignment in the Amazon and I had to take a rickety old bus for about two days over the Andes. This bus was filled with goats and pigs and chickens and children and old people and everybody on that bus, everything on that bus was vomiting most of the way including me. But at the end, we finally we get to the end of the road and then there's like another two day walk into the jungle to where I'm going to spend the next two years. And as we're walking into the jungle, as I'm walking in, I'm trying to, I'm practicing my lousy Spanish. And to my chagrin, I discover that the people coming out speak worse Spanish than I do. That they're schwa, they're indigenous people who speak schwa, not Spanish. So the Peace Corps has just put me through this course to learn Spanish and sent me in to live with people who don't speak Spanish. And finally I get into the community where I'm supposed to spend the next two years and, and there's, one, there's a couple of people there that speak, some Sp that speak Spanish and, and one's a school teacher and he tries to understand my Spanish. He comes up to me and I say to him, hey, you know, I'm here to help you guys form your credit and savings co-ops. And he looks at me and he says, you know, we don't have any money here. It's all barter. You're guinea pig for my papayas. But I grew up in New Hampshire as a Calvinist, you know, a, a Puritan, and, and, and if there's one thing that we're taught, it's by God when you're sent in to do a job, you do it. Now the Peace Corps had sent me in with a backpack filled with uh, comic books in color, in Spanish, about how to form credit and savings co-ops. So, I have, so, you know, it's my job to hand out these comic books. So every day I hand out these comic books and everybody takes them. And then every night I'd stand up in front of the, the community and talk about forming credit and savings co-ops in my lousy Spanish. And an amazing thing happened. People kept coming to hear me. More and more people every night would come in. And it reached the point that people were walking for five or six hours to get to hear me. And, and I did this both in the Amazon and in the Andes and sort of a combination of these. And these people would come in. And I'm beginning to think, my God, you know, Calvinism really works. But this teacher takes me aside at some point and he says, um, you know, have you looked around and noticed that there aren't any televisions in our community? There aren't any radios. There's no electricity. There aren't any magazines. Nobody can read. You're it. <laughs> I was Saturday Night Live, you know. The word had gone out that this is tall, skinny gringo who can't shoot a blowgun, doesn't know how to get around in the jungle, He's crying all the time. I was very depressed at this point. He's crying all the time. And he's not going to live for very much longer. So you better come see him now, you know. Um, and at this point, I understand that my vaunted education doesn't offer these people anything. But they had a lot to teach me. And one of the most important things they had to teach me was observation and, and getting messages and, and listening to the messages that are out there and they really miss, listen to the messages if a little plant is sick beside the trail they'll often accept that as a message that they need to move the trail stop using that trail and then I got very very sick at one point and, and it, when I was with indigenous people I, I lost about 35 pounds in a week I was dying and the teacher comes up to me and he's leading this decrepit looking old man by the hand and he says, this is the shaman. And I said, well, that's great. What's a shaman? I'm from New Hampshire, you know. And, and he says, he can cure you. And the old man looks me up and down, and he says, you're dying. And I said, I know it. <laughs> and he said, well, that's good, because they believe in reincarnation, and it's like, you know, you probably ought to get out of this life and move on to the next one. And at that point, 
And I started crying again. So he says, well, maybe you're not ready. And I said, no, I, I don't think I'm ready. So he offers to cure me. He says, I can, the alternative is I could cure you tonight. So I thought I would take that. And that night he did. And what happened, he took me on what we call a shamanic journey. And that night I saw that my parents in New Hampshire had raised me meat and potatoes, don't eat onions, don't eat spices, don't eat anything that's unusual. And don't get your feet wet in the winter, you'll catch cold. And now I'm living with the schwa and I'm eating grubs that come out of trees. We're drinking this strange liquid that's, anyway, kind of a beer that's made from, anyway, never mind. But uh, every time I ate any of these foods or drank this chicha beer, I could hear my mother saying, it'll kill you. So it was. And that night I saw in that shamanic journey that um, the schwa, all these indigenous people I was working with in the Quechua were very healthy. The men are all built like Rambo, short but built like Rambo. The women are sexy and gorgeous. And so the people live to be very old, some of them. So there must be something wrong in the paradigm my mother's taught me, my parents taught me. And by just that change of paradigm, by just that change of mindset, it healed me. And the next morning, I was fine and continued to be fine. And the reason I tell this story is because I think we're at a time like that in our society. We've, we're living on a planet that's very, we're a society that's very endangered, a species that's very endangered on our own planet. We have all these problems that are facing us. And what we need to do is just get a different mindset to how we look at that. I'll talk in just a minute about how I think the big corporations are the ones that are driving all of this. And we need to change the mindset of big corporations. Um, and that takes me into uh, the, the, the concept of economic hitman. How did we get here? How did corporations get here? What is an economic hitman? Well, we economic hitmen during the past uh, decades have managed to create the world's first truly global empire. And we've done it for the first time primarily without the military through economics. We work many different ways, but perhaps the most common is that we will identify a third world country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters, but the money doesn't actually go to the country. Instead, it goes to one of our corporations that build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, highways, things that will benefit a few of the rich people in that country, as well as our own corporations. But the majority of the people don't get any benefits. They're too poor to buy electricity or to drive cars, and they don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. But they and the whole country are left holding a huge debt. And it's such a big debt that they can't repay it. So at some time, point, we go back to the country and say, you owe us a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so give us a pound of flesh. Sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies or vote with us on the next critical UN vote, or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq. And in that way, we've created this empire. Uh, on the few occasions when we fail, as I talk about in Secret History of the American Empire and Confessions of an Economic Hitman, I failed with Jaime Roldos of Ecuador, President of Ecuador, and Omar Torrijos of Panama. On those occasions, uh, the jackals come in. And these are people who overthrow governments or assassinate their leaders. So in the case of Jaime Roldos of, of Ecuador and Omar Torrijos of Panama, because they didn't allow me to corrupt them to, to get these huge loans that would put their country deep into debt, they were assassinated by CIA-sponsored operatives, jackals. And on the few occasions when the jackals fail, such as in Iraq, when both the economic hitmen and jackals fail, then and only then, does the military go in? So we've created this empire in a very new way in history. And it's an empire that's been done pretty much in secret. Most of us in the United States don't realize we're the beneficiaries of an empire built on exploitation of resources and people ruthlessly often around the world. I think we all have to question our role as a democracy under these circumstances because a democracy is built on the assumption that the electorate is informed. And if, if we're not informed about this most basic principle of our foreign policy, 
then we're not informed. Uh, we're, and, and you have to question whether we can truly vote intelligently. I think this is a very, very serious problem and an important one that, that we all need to face and confront. Um, but the good news is that the modern equivalent of the emperor is not our president, obviously. An emperor is a person who does not serve a limited term, is not elected, and doesn't report to anyone. Our presidents are not in that category. But we have a group of people that I call the corporatocracy who run our biggest corporations. And this isn't a conspiracy theory. These people don't have to conspire to do illegal things. But they really control our politicians through campaign financing and especially through lobbyists. They control our media either by outright ownership or indirectly through advertising budgets. And they really run the, the, the show. They are really in charge of the world today. Uh, in fact, you might envision the geopolitics of the world today as not being um, revolving around nations. Anymore. It's not Russia or the United States or China. You could really envision as these big clouds floating around the planet. And they don't know any national borders. These are the corporations. And they are really in control today. And in that, I think, is a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to, for us to transform the world, for us to create and force these corporations to create something different. Because unlike other empires, this one is not built on the military. Therefore, we don't have to fight it or change it through violence. We can do, through, do it through the way that we shop or don't shop. Because all these major big corporations are totally dependent on you to buy their goods and services. They're completely dependent on you. And in the past, they've been very, very susceptible to us so that you know, we've forced corporations to clean up polluted rivers all over the country. We forced them to get rid of uh, the aerosol cans that were destroying the ozone layer and to open their doors wider to um, African Americans and other minorities and to women and to get rid of trans fats in their food and to get rid of um, antibiotics in chickens like Tyson's recently did. We, the consumer, have forced this to happen. We've made this happen. And now we just need to ratchet that up a notch. I think we need to understand that these corporations Today, the corporatocracy is driven by one goal, one single goal, and that goal is to maximize profits regardless of the environmental and social costs, regardless of the environmental and social costs. And we need to turn that around and let the corporations know that maximizing profits is fine but only within the context of creating an environmentally sustainable, socially just, and peaceful world. And we have the power to do that. You have the power to do that. You and I have the power to do that, and all of us together have that power. And so it's a tremendous opportunity that we have here to move into this revolution. And it truly is a revolution. I, I really believe that we're at a time in history now that's equivalent to when the nation, the, the city-states became nations. And we're now at a time where the nations are not very important. The big the corporations are important. And we have the power to change them. One of the reasons that, that I'm, another reason that I'm optimistic is because every one of these corporations is run by people like you. Some of you are running some of these corporations, I'm sure. And these people have children and grandchildren and nephews and nieces. I know a lot of corporate executives and CEOs, and I don't know one who wants to see Florida sink beneath the ocean or who wants to see the ozone layer destroyed. I know a lot of them who want to see a better world for their children and grandchildren. But they're driven by this one goal that they learn in business school and they learn as they come up through the corporation, and that is to maximize profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. When we convince them, when we go in and let them know that we're not going to buy a jacket made in a sweatshop, 